Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And guess what? It's Community Matters because community does matter. Michael Bruno is the provost of UH, UH uh, Manoa, or UH the whole system. Which one? UH Manoa. Thank okay, you. he joins us today. We are so happy to have him here with us because we want to learn more about the university in this time of COVID and inflection. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. So here you are, and uh, in, all you guys uh, must be thinking about how how the university is changing, will change, must change, um, because everything is changing. And you know, uh, the, the prize goes to the nimble. The prize goes to the one who sees the change. So, what are your thoughts about this in general, Michael? Wow, we talk a lot about agility right now, Jay. Um, you know, being resilient means you prepare you respond, and importantly, you adapt. Uh, the, the, the organizations that are gonna come out of this in a stronger position are the ones that can adapt to whatever the new reality uh, that evolves. And we're working hard to provide that uh, flexibility, that adaptability that goes everywhere from um, how we onboard people, new faculty and staff, to the programs that we deliver um, to how we take care of our students and our staff and our faculty to make sure uh, the students learn, the faculty teach, staff support, and they do all of that in a very safe, in a very safe and effect, in effective way. Yeah, yeah, that'd be the primary thing right now because um, although uh, Jabsom is working on some pretty interesting projects uh, around COVID, fact is we don't have a therapeutic. Um, uh, and we don't have a we don't have a vaccine, and there's no guarantee we'll have either of those. And so the important thing now is to um, you know look at how to flatten the curve. People don't use that as much the last couple of weeks about flatten the curve. They they have other ways of looking at it, um, and and also about uh, testing and tracking, uh, which which technology can help us a lot with, and I think the university can help us a lot with. Can we talk about the university's um, sort of technological response to the disease itself? And then we'll talk about the, the Delta factor. Yeah, that's good. It's a great question. Uh, the community, that means the university community, responded very, very early on to, to this. I and mean, we were having discussions going back to late February with groups of faculty primarily about beginning the preparations for a a possible move to the online delivery of courses. So that involved then uh, looking at best practices, most effective technologies, the resources that we would need to provide to the faculty and also frankly to the students. So, so that aspect started, how do, you, how do you learn remotely? Um, at the same time, in particular, our medical science faculty and administration and even some students were looking forward to how do we play a positive role. And, and I'll add to that the engineering students and the engineering faculty. So there were, there were so many examples of our faculty and their students kind of rising to the task and providing technology-based support to the community as we began to battle this, this pandemic here. You know, I, um, I, I, this is, there's a mindset about this, uh, and it's not necessarily, um, I want to make a million billion, want to commercialize some smart idea. Um, it, it's also um, not necessarily, I want to save the world. It's this, it, this is my own personal experience. I'm interested in your personal experience and, and what, you, what you sense around the university. I think it, the mindset that I see that I feel is, uh, I, I want to take, I want, we are at an inflection point and I want to do something good. Um, I want to see if I can't find a vacuum to fill. I, I, want, to, I want to do creative things that I, that I never had a chance to do before. But now, the, you know, the, the world is open for creativity. Let's see if I can, in Jefferson's term, Jefferson said, make yourself useful. I want to see if I can make myself useful you know, in a community context. Well, how do you feel? What motivates people to do that? You know, two parts to that, uh, Jay. It's a, great, it's a great question. Number one, academia writ large um, across the nation has 
really been undergoing a, a, a slow but steady transformation uh, with faculty more and more interested in having an impact. Uh, the days of the so-called ivory tower where a faculty member is judged solely by the number of papers and that sort of thing, uh, those days are long gone. And in particular, in the technology domains, science and engineering in particular, um, you know, we want to see what impact you're having out in the broader community. So that's that's number one. And I would say, and the thing that I've really come to appreciate in my nearly five years here at the university is the, the strength of the connection out into the community uh, with the uh, other nonprofits, with the, the healthcare system, with uh, engineering and consulting firms, the business community, the connection is really extraordinary. So you combine those two things and you, you're, you're, you're really set up for the community writ large to engage directly with faculty on campus who are anxious, anxious to make a difference. Yeah, the word outreach comes to mind. I, I got a survey yesterday about UH, uh, it's a Peter Adler Accord 3.0 survey, and he's, uh, he's gathering uh, opinions in the community about uh, how the university is doing. I don't know the results of this, um, but we'll, we'll hear about results. Um, and you know what the outreach might be in the future, and maybe this is an inflection point for outreach too. Um, you know, for example, one of the questions and your your comments made me think of it was, um, Ed, select as many as you wish of the following things where you think the university UH could achieve some success in outreach, and that you would want to be part of. You know? And there were about oh, I guess ten things. And it's all about mm, training a new generation of, of workers, a, a new generation for Hawaii, a new generation that is up to, up to speed, up to grade um, on technology and all other things that may be relevant to our time, um, you know, to go into the next chapter of our state. And to me, this is a fascinating uh, kind of question because there's so many things what, you know, come to mind. Um, this is a great opportunity to do things that we never did before to benefit the community, every person as we have not before. It doesn't stop at a degree, it goes further. You're right, you know, and it never stops at a degree. We, we had our commencement, you know, virtual commencement activities this year, very bittersweet and very emotional. Um, and just, I, you know that these students are anxious to get out and, and make a difference in their, they were seeing it over the last couple of months with their own, their own faculty. And this, this came up in some of the, uh, some of the gatherings, you know, I'll give you some examples that people might not know of. So, so out of the blue, I get an email that the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, CTAR, you know, they have a fashion program. Well, that program teamed with our theater and dance department really early on and said, hey, there's a real shortage of masks. We're the, we're the designers. We know fabric. We're starting to get some indication of what kind of uh, fabric we need, you know, to, to guard against particulates uh, of certain diameters. So, you know, that, that chatter went on across a couple of days and boom, they started manufacturing masks in a big way. And, and the same was true with engineering who said, wow, uh, face shields, we can 3D print these face shields. And then of course, as everyone knows, one thing led to another and they also got involved in the redesign of ventilators. Um, none of those initiatives happened top down. None of those initiatives was prescribed by anybody like myself or President Lasner or anyone. This, this came bottom up. I know a lot of it came up from students to their faculty mentors. Hey, we can do this. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And it was, it was really inspirational. Um, of course, we know the stories about our nurses and our, our uh, physicians and our, our medical students, you know, and those uh, very inspiring um, putting themselves in harm's, harm's way on the, on the front lines. But I think people should know that even, even in these other disciplines, quite surprising, 
quite surprisingly, uh, people stepped up. Yeah, and it goes back to the question of why, what, what motivated them. Uh, I would doubt they're in there to make a million billion. Um, I would doubt uh, they're, they're in here they're to, you know, help the people in, um, I don't know, Western Europe. Um, they're probably, they're probably motivated to help the people in Hawaii and help the university. Am I right? You're totally right. Uh, that that strength, that connection, I, I you know, it's it's interesting. I, I interview people all the time coming here for senior positions, like like deans of colleges. I often find myself saying, you know, if we're out to dinner, uh, you have to understand, we are quite literally the only game in town. So yes, you know, kind of humorously, if you want to come watch baseball or football or volleyball or what have you, you're coming to the University of Hawaii. Uh, no professional sports teams here. But more importantly for, for that conversation, this conversation, if the state has an issue with respect to health care, with respect to sea level rise, um, a, a volcano erupting on, on the big island, uh, the governor, the legislature, those departments come to the University of Hawaii. And, uh, and that's really exciting for the right type of administrator, for the right type of faculty, and, and even for the right type of student. That is all you're asking for. You want to see your work, your research, your technology and knowledge put to good use out in society. Yeah. I, I see this, um, let me call it an inflection point again, um, as, a, as a pivot where we fully understand that. Uh, we see the expertise at the university more useful for the community. We see the community more appreciative of that expertise. We see uh, a connection uh, in government and business, uh, you know, and in the community in general, where the university is helping and we want, we appreciate their help. And, and we have no reservations in funding that because we can see the benefit right now, right, right, right in front of our eyes. So this is, this is a, a kind of a, a destiny uh, that has been long in coming and is here. I see this as, as being a very important moment. I, I, I think you're right on. Um, and President Lasner and I have been talking about this over the last month that, you know, as, as these various groups uh, at the university, among our community, have emerged as as thought leaders and as as doers, really, in response to this emergency, public health emergency, and also we should also men mention the fiscal emergency. So you have you hero, I mean, just churning out analyses and reports that are that are really really important in guiding the governor and the legislature. Um, so I'd be remiss not mentioning that. It's really mm -hmm. significant. And, and as you said, all that comes together to really further strengthen the bond between the university and policymakers and the business community. Um, and I think that's, I really think that's a permanent situation and one that I hope uh, the community and government will lean on strongly as we make decisions on the future of the state post-pandemic, because that's going to be where the real work, you know, that's that's the rubber meets the road when we make those decisions. What What is the new economy? Not just, you know, we've been hearing about that for a long time, but uh, now more than ever, I think everybody who talks about it means it. There's, it's time for action. Yeah, well, I mean, if we do same old, you know, do it the way that we used to do it before, that that really won't suffice. Um, because uh, it's not not so easy to start up an economy, uh, you know. And there's um, I, I heard uh, various points on this on NPR this morning. Um, you know, you get a certain camp thinks, uh, um, well, we have a coiled spring nationally, uh, and it's just ready to go. And then mm -hmm. other people say, well, you know, you, you don't realize that that the, the relationships, the connections in a working economy, they they tend to degrade pretty quickly if the economy's not happening. So it's anybody's guess, maybe you hero knows more about this, it's anybody's guess about how quickly things could come together. Uh, but the problem is you can't just say, okay, have at it, Oklahoma land rush. It's not like that. Um, yeah. it's, it's more like we have to go step by step and we have to test each step. This has to be with great expertise, great thought, 
great concern. The university can help in that. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's, it's going to be significantly different for all of us. Yeah. And I think the smart money knows that, and the smart money begins looking for the opportunities of contributing uh, to the new, the new economy and the new university. And, and I'm really happy to hear that, that you're doing that. Uh, it, it benefits the faculty, the students, the researchers, the administration, uh, everything at the university. But, but query this. You know, we were talking yesterday about uh, utilities and how they, uh, they're consolidating around the country. It's a natural process. And if you look at um, universities, you find that just state universities, uh, you know, the public universities have, have grown much bigger. Um, I'm not sure why, you probably know why, um, but isn't it, isn't it reasonable to assume that going forward, there'll be a consolidation of higher education? And although UH will be a local university, our university, the ones, uh, you know, the, the university that we care about, that we are enmeshed with, uh, but also it's a state university and it will be closer, it will consolidate with other state universities in a kind of regional way. Do you see that in the future? I do, I do. In our, in our strategic uh, conversations, particularly over the last oh, 12 to 18 months, I, I often find myself emphasizing that we, we need to make sure those conversations are in the context of, of who we are and where we are. So what are, the, what are the things that by virtue of who we are as the state university, the only public research one university in the state of Hawaii, and by virtue of our location in the middle of the Pacific as an island state, um, what, what do those characteristics then um, provide for in terms of um, our strategic imperatives? We, uh, our programs must be responsive to state needs. And at the same time, they must capitalize on our strengths, including our location. So it's, it's, no, it's no surprise to anybody that marine sciences and astronomy emerged as major, major strengths. Um, I think we need to, to build on those and some other disciplines. Um, agriculture comes to mind and some of the unique um, business opportunities, international business and economics and um, our linguistics programs and, and Asia Pacific programs. These are unique uh, to UH and they are areas that we can export. So we could, we could talk forever about, you know, sustainable, sustainable agriculture, sustainable um, uh, use of the oceans. Um, protection of coastal communities against climate change and sea level rise. The entire world is going to have to look at these issues. We're just, in a, in a large sense, we're first. Mm -hmm. So sure. if we can, you know, we can capitalize, we can export this knowledge, we can export technologies. Yeah, this is what Alan Oshima said uh, about, uh, about the work of Hawaiian Electric. Uh, a few months ago before COVID, just as it was starting, in fact, he said what, what they were interested in doing these days is sharing what they learned about renewable energy with other places. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, counseling, consulting, what have you, even making some money in taking the technology that they had learned about and implemented here uh, for the benefit of other places. And, and Hawaii does have expertise that is worth exporting. And of course, export, export assumes there's some transaction going on. It isn't just a giveaway. Um, so I totally agree. And I think that this is a time for that. But it seems to me that take agriculture for a moment. Agriculture has been, you know, a kind of frustration uh, since the demise of the plantations. Uh, we have the technology. We have a, a history, a hundred. It goes back to the development of sitar 110 years ago, whatever it was, right? And um, you know, we have the technology, but but we don't have the incentives that will encourage young people uh, to go out and start agricultural facilities, farms, um, and that requires a handshake between the university and the powers that be, because you, in order to incentivize, you have to deal with tax and land. You have to deal with with policy, you have to incentivize. It's, it doesn't come easy or cheap, especially in an island state where land is limited. Um, yeah. So, I, go ahead. 
I, mean, I just want to add to that that there I think I think sometimes we lose sight of the the cultural aspects of the change that we need to make. So when it comes to agriculture, you're talking about uh, people's dietary habits, you know, uh, should it be possible for us as an island state to have all the various berries 12 months of the year? Is that natural? That's not natural. There should be some seasonality. And maybe that seasonality gets driven by, you know, more produce being grown here. The same with, with protein. What, where do you get your protein? Well, we're an island. Oh, should we look more to aquaculture and, and other forms? And you mentioned energy. Of course, UH is one of the, the country's leaders in alternative energy development and delivery. Um, the same is true there. I mean, you don't, you don't drive around anywhere else in the US and see as many um, photovoltaic cells on roofs as you do here. It's, it's part of the culture here. And as time goes on, you know, that will become even more and more. And the last thing I'll add to that is water. Island community, water is, is, is our uh, most precious resource. And, and we have ways of dealing with and, and using, managing, even charging for water here that, that don't exist in other states. And um, so it's, it's a bit of, it's a bit of culture. It's a, it's a bit of sociology that needs to come to the fore as we make some of these necessary changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's all kinds of possibilities out there. One thing you mentioned, which it, it struck me as an interesting point, is that years ago, I guess it was in the 60s, uh, Congress established the East-West Center as an international meeting place, uh, a place which would welcome people from Asia, you know, to meet with Americans and, for that matter, Europeans and develop, um, you know, research programs and writing programs and so forth. Still exists, although uh, relatively speaking, I don't think Congress is as interested in the East-West Center as it used to be. But the East-West Center is essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the expression of UH's international, you mentioned the Scheidler School, and of course that's international business, but international relations, foreign policy kinds of things, you know. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I follow uh, what happens in that in that realm, but it seems to me that one of these days, um, you may wind up being closer to the East-West Center uh, going forward. It may be part of your international outreach, don't you think? Yeah, it already is. I have to say, Jay, uh, over the last three or so years uh, under the new leadership at the East-West Center, there really has been a very strong coming together of our two organizations. Um, you know, in the, in this domain, you really can't you really can't top the brand uh, of the East West Center. Uh, uh, the East West Center is known throughout the world, in particular across the Asia Pacific region. Um, but that is also, as I alluded to earlier, that is one of the unique uh, aspects of who we are and where we are at UH Manoa. So, so that coming together is is a natural, and I'm, I'm happy to say that there's there's a, a, a lot more both formal and informal partnering these days between the East West Center and the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and, and only good can come out of that. I it's, agree, yeah. I agree, that's a great, thank you for mentioning that. So uh, we talked before the show began about, um, about professional schools, uh, schools where you could learn something here. We have a medical school. There are not that many medical schools around the country. Uh, people can come here and go to medical school, although we probably need greater facilities to accommodate a lot of additional students. Um, and um, we don't have a dental school. Um, we have agriculture, but um, maybe, uh, and we have oceanography. But there are schools on the mainland that we would have to establish here from scratch if we were going to you know, build that into the fabric of the new university. And, and query, is that really necessary if we establish, um, you know, uh, collabor collaborative, consolidative kind of arrangements with, uh, with regional groups of higher educational uh, uh, public, public uh, universities? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. You know, I think um, higher education has been evolving uh, for some time now, certainly going before the the Great Recession, um, where there has been, for most universities, 
a recognition that they can no longer be all things to all people. Um, and they would have to, I'll go back to that, be true to where you are and who you are. And, and if, if, uh, if you can't deliver a program effectively or efficiently, uh, then maybe your students, your local students and others will need to go elsewhere for that education. I often mention the fact that we, we don't have a vet school at, at UH. Uh, so why is that? Somebody clearly along the line, uh, somebody said, well, if our local students want to go to vet school, they'll have to go somewhere else for that. And, and there are other examples we can point to, but um, this university, like all other universities, public and private, over the next couple of years, I think are gonna find ourselves um, asking that question perhaps in a more forceful way in a, in a very, you know, be in a very reflective mode on, on where are the priorities for, for Hawaii um, and where are the strengths that we can capitalize to make real impact both here and, and globally. Mm. Yeah, including, including Asia, of course. But I, I can see uh, exchange students uh, in, in a consolidated regional larger grouping. I could uh, see courses uh, and I could see tuition where you have a, a discount or one place or the other or both. Um, there's all kinds of possibilities. Uh, this is a time for creativity, uh, not just for uh, students figuring out uh, uh, how to make masks, but for you, <laughs> especially for you. This must be the kind of time where you wake at three o'clock in the morning with ideas <laughs> and, you know, and, and, um, and in the morning you can try to implement them or you can not try to, you know, the three o'clock in the morning idea is the one that, that, that shows what's going on. So my question to you is, what do you worry about, Michael? Um, what are the challenges? What are the pitfalls going forward? Because just as much as you might have a really great idea, a great, you know, creative uh, solution, uh, a great reshaping of the university and its mission and its students and faculty and research and all, all that, uh, you might make a mistake. So what are the things that worry you in going forward? Yeah. Oh, well, one of the things is the the concern that um, we, we may not be reaching everyone when we have those conversations about what, what, are, the, uh, what are the urgent um, needs of our community and how can we best address those needs. Uh, we are Hawaii's research university. We do the teaching, the service, and that essential research that's going to drive new new knowledge and, and new products, technologies, uh, solutions. Uh, but we need to make sure that all of that is as responsive as possible uh, to the the place that gives us our name and and a good share of our of our budget. And and so I I I, I don't maybe worry is too strong a word, but um, I. Uh, I certainly am concerned that um, we need to just keep at it. You know, we've had a little uh, bump in the road, so to speak, and in, in having those conversations, but I've been engaging with various foundations um, in Hawaii and, and certainly the ledge and the, the governor's office, um, uh, business Roundtable, and others, um, our board members, both uh, UH, um, uh, Board of Regents, as well as the um, the foundation, UH Foundation Board, they've been fantastic as far as offering their advice, guidance, expertise. We just um, we just need to make sure those conversations continue and that we take them to heart because um, we just I think all faculty recognize you can't circle the wagons and say no. We need to protect what is in place. That's that's not, no university is gonna have success if all they want is to continue on with business as usual. Mm. Yeah, you know, I was very impressed um, with um, Dave Carl's uh, 70th uh, surprise birthday party where 70 some odd people showed up. You spoke, uh, Vasily Simos uh, spoke, 
Um, and it was a, a sense of, and, and, and people from all over the country were involved in, in those 70 people. Um, and I was impressed in this, in this sense. It was, um, it was certainly about research. It was certainly about So West and uh, Seymour and those organizations that do the American, you know, ocean, oceanography research. But, but it was also about a family, a family of the UH people. Uh, on the same page, enjoying their careers, enjoying their their fellows, um, and and uh, there was something um, extraordinary about it. In the sense, I don't think this would have happened before COVID. I don't think it would have happened before Zoom. Um, and I'm wondering how you felt about that, and whether that sort of teaches us something about the the social family environment that we need to have to achieve what you're talking about going forward. Yeah, I, well, I got a lot of the same reaction myself being there and seeing Professor Carl and how important uh, this was to him, how touched he was by the event. Of course, he's one of the uh, legendary oceanographers in the world, um, has achieved all of the possible honors and awards that one can achieve in, in this field. Um, to your point about family, it, 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 it has struck me, it struck me right away when I arrived here that uh, the university is really a very strong community. I think part of that is as we have, we've been talking about that connection to the community. And I wanna go one step further um, with another recent episode. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a series of speakers that we run at the university, anywhere from four to sometimes as many as six different speakers across the year. And when I first got here, all those speakers tended to be folks from the mainland. And the group of us sat down one day and I, I just asked that obvious question, you know, we have some of the most famous, you know, artists and scientists uh, in the world here. Why don't we showcase them in our community? So we, we've started to do that. So roughly half of those talks now are UH faculty and the very first time we did that, I'll never forget, it was um, Professor Mark Hickson from um, our College of Natural Sciences. He's a world-known um, expert in uh, coral reef, uh, coral reef biology. And um, so his talk was really around climate change and impact on corals. Well, we had standing room only, I would guess between 500 and 600 people at the talk. And when I began and when I introduced uh, the, the talk, really, I thought almost a throwaway line. I said, so we often invite people from the mainland, but in point of fact, the world's experts are often right here in your University of Hawaii. And you know what? That room erupted in applause spontaneously. People were really touched by that notion that yes right here there is this place of excellence and you know people like Professor Dave Carl um, you know they are emblematic they represent that excellence and as I said in my remarks it's that excellence that attracts people to the university it's that excellence that that pushes up our reputation for everybody uh, and and the and the state and and its citizens should be really proud of that excellence. Yeah, and it's a world brand, and it will attract people uh, in many ways from everywhere. Thank you so much, Michael Bruno. Really appreciate you coming down and talking to me, uh, Michael Bruno, the provost of uh, University of Hawaii Manoa. Uh, we hope we can talk with you again soon, and all the best in your efforts to remake the university and the state going forward. Thank you so much.